I have the great, great honor to introduce to you a quite remarkable lady, Sada Mire. She is a forerunner when it comes to archaeology in Somaliland. She is the co-founder of Somaliland's Department of Archaeology. She is the only active archaeologist of today in Somalia. And um, she's also the founder of the humanitarian organization Horn Heritage, active in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somaliland. And you're currently also a guest professor at the Leiden University in the Netherlands. And Sada is here today to generously offer us her very deep and personal story. The stage is yours. Thank you. Today is the 7th of November. The 7th of November, many years ago, I landed at Orlanda. I was a child refugee. I came with my equally underage siblings without a parent accompanying us. What I remember of that day is walking behind a policewoman, leading us to what I later learned in Swedish is Verhörsal. So we walked behind her, and I remember thinking, she spilled strangely. This was a policewoman, of course. She walks with firm steps, I'd never seen a woman walk like that. I also remember what she was wearing. She was wearing khaki pants and light green top. The second memory of that day is being driven through a road in the dark, countryside road, and stopping at a building. It was in the middle of the night, and my sister and I were tucked in bed. And this blonde woman placed a kiss on my cheek. After having that kiss imprinted on my cheek, a few months later of catching up with where I was, uh, after just having come from um, a war zone to this calm country in the middle of November, discovering the cold, I thought, I want to learn about the people, the place and its history. And I think it was more of a selfish wish. I wanted to understand why I was here and what I had in common with the Swedish people. So I said to my teacher, I want to read, I want to learn how to write and read Swedish. And I saw it as a, as a tool. But immediately, I felt at first that Swedish language sounded really horrible. I thought, wow, this is what I have to learn in order to understand the people and the culture and the place. But I come from a nomadic culture where grandmother, my grandmother used to tell me stories. So I was very fond of literature. So I went to my Swedish teacher and I said, can you recommend me a book? And um, he, um, he wrote a name on a piece of paper and I went to uh, Malmö Stadsbibliothek, and I gave it to the librarian, and she gave me a book, um, Mina Drömmer Stad, by Per Anders Fögerström. I took the book with me, I read it, I came back with the same note, with the same author. I said, can I have another book? And she said, of this same author, and I said, sure. And then I went home with another book, 
I realized also that book was about Stockholm. And then I read a few more books about him. And um, it was, for me, interesting to discover Swedish history and heritage and culture through narratives. Because I think reading uh, Mina Drömmarstad led me to reading uh, Ivar Lo Johansson. Um, that also explained to me a little bit about things that I could resonate with in this Swedish society. People who were very poor, who were working on the land in a feudal system in a Sweden which was at the time extremely poor. And that author led me to Willem Mubai and his trilogy. And then I was shocked. I realized it's not just me who has fled something painful. Here are all of these narratives about Swedish people are actually crossing this dangerous uh, sea of the Atlantic to go to the US and build a new society, new life. And their stories really resonated with me. And in fact, it just showed me that I belonged here. Through reading these narratives, I came out from being this uh, scared child refugee, feeling inferior, not being able to explain where I come from, feeling these people will not understand, to actually knowing had just 100 years ago that a lot of people were facing similar realities, uh, displacement, and moving to another place. I also went and dug deeper, literally. So I started studying archaeology at Lund University. Um, and there I learned that Swedes were not just traveling from uh, the feudal system and getting to new places where they could go and uh, create new lives, but the Vikings traveled. And I remember as a zoo archaeologist digging in Upokra, which we'll, I'm looking forward to hearing about tomorrow, uh, that um, we were excavating. Uh, I was learning um, about bones at the time, um, and we unearthed Abbasid coins. And all of a sudden, in my group of, uh, in my team, I looked at it and I said, I can read this. It was Kufic writing, Arabic Kufic writing. And I had attended uh, in Somalia, in Mogadishu, Quranic school. Somalia was a socialist, so it was uh, optional. And my parents thought that could help me learn Arabic. And uh, so um, we, it was a way to learn our culture, but also learned um, the Arabic language. And it was interesting because I was surrounded by people who really welcomed me as the only foreigner digging there in various other places in, the, uh, in Skåne that we were excavating, and feel also that somehow there was this connection with the Viking Age that actually here were people who have traveled, who have navigated, who have interacted with people that don't look like them, that don't live like them. And it inspired me to understand that this movement is very human. And there is so much knowledge, so much experiences, so much um, insight to be brought out of that type of heritage. It's also spectacular to know places like Up Okra were cosmopolitan, um, uh, like York in, in the UK, was very interesting to me. But also, the first object I was handed in the archaeology class was a stone axe. And here I was in my classroom in Lund University being handed a stone axe which says Somaliland. 
and I thought, oh. Um, uh, I asked the teacher, where does this come from? And he said he didn't know. And I started looking for if there was anything, any collections anywhere. And then I came across a publication by Stig Jonsson, who worked for the, he was on a project with CEDA, and read his document and learned that actually Sweden, unlike the former colonial powers, Italy and England, was the country that tried to create an indigenous Somali archaeology. Stig Jansson was actually one of the people sent by CEDA to implement a capacity building project in Mogadishu, in my city. And he was there at the time I was there, in the 80s, helping Somalis to learn archaeology. And I thought, what a coincidence. And here, without knowing this information, I am digging Scandinavian archaeology, and a Swede was there. And of course, now I feel that, you know, yeah, it's only right that I do it. And um, that, I mentioned this because there are small seeds along the way. Another thing that I later appreciated after living abroad, I haven't lived in Sweden since 2003, was not just the archaeological education, but the other values I took with me from Sweden, which was just simple things uh, about life, uh, being able to um, go for a bike ride. Uh, earlier, we had somebody talking about um, getting kids out to the, uh, to the nature. At the time, we only needed, you know, we, a bike. Um, and one of the things for me that's so important is um, seemingly things that we take for granted. Alamansret. I know I've tried to camp in many places in the US, in England, and I've always had to really be careful. Am I, can I be here? As a, can, I, can I camp here? In Sweden, you don't have to worry about that. Another uh, seemingly um, kind of, not insignificant, but also taken for granted is for is leave and how that nurtures you. I'm trying to think of similar concepts in English. Um, I can't really translate for is leave. So communal organized activities where people actually do things together. Um, and these things were things that I didn't think about at the time, but later all had an impact in how I thought about communities and how I actually moved on to do archaeology. Um, again, for me, looking at community and heritage, one of the things also that I took with me is the accessibility. Our accessibility in terms of here, it's Costa Buda, I think, uh, learning how to uh, blow glass, which is an old tradition. And later, I started to think about archaeology actually differently uh, by reflecting on what this means, but also where I come from. So I started reflecting on actually uh, how I learned things. Did I learn everything from a book, from a school? What did I learn from school in, when I was growing up? And it was actually much more different. It was more about what I learned with my family. And this is where I then moved to think about how I approach archaeology and heritage. And one of the first things was when I went to the UK um, and learned about uh, the destruction of archaeological sites in Somalia, that nobody actually bothered making reports about it, uh, getting people to, under, to know even about the destruction, the museums that were looted. And I was very uh, worried that actually my countrymen, Somalis, did not seem to know about archaeology. 
um, and did not seem to value. And I also learned that I was the only active Somali archaeologist. So I thought, okay, um, I better ask people about what they really see as their cultural heritage. And I remember we had a conversation earlier about um, how to define cultural, cultural heritage. And I was having the same situation, a country and a people who never knew about any archaeological institutions. So how do you ask even the question? Um, I showed them catalog and I said, all of these objects are gone. And they're like, OK, so what? They had not known about this. And I went back to Stig Jonsson's report, where he was criticizing the fact that the previous, previously archaeology in Somalia was done in a way where um, the people who were doing it uh, often took the material back to the metropolitan, wherever they came from, and in fact left no reports to the ministries. Uh, so it made sense to me, aha, this is why the local people do not know anything about it, because no one actually bothered. And then this CEDA project we tried to develop actually got interrupted because of the civil war, starting it. And then now I was there, the civil war had not stopped, and I was doing archaeology, trying to get a bunch of refugees to care about archaeology when they had other things to worry about. Um, and that is actually when I started thinking the approaches to archaeology are really important. How we approach cultural heritage and how we communicate with people about it. Uh, because now Somalis had no idea what these objects were, how important they were. And I got frustrated. I thought, here I am living in London, um, taking a huge student loan for potentially working with Somali heritage, and nobody seems to care. So I asked them, I said, what's your heritage? More of a, but then what's your heritage kind of um, way it came out. And people actually were um, all of a sudden, ah, well, I come, my family come from this region, and my grandmother taught me how to make um, that type of port or that type of house. All of a sudden, they started talking about their own knowledge, their own experiences. So I thought, hang on, so no knowledge of archaeology, yet all these women, all these men are displaying the exact type of knowledge that I need as an archaeologist about how to make an object, when to use it, what to use it for, and felt this is really incredible because um, a lot of the literature just assumes that people don't know about their heritage. So obviously we are talking about different ways of looking at the past, different ways of preserving heritage. Uh, they never went to the museums. I interviewed one of the directors of the former, um, uh, former directors of the former museum, because the museum no longer exists. And he said to me, but Sada, I didn't even want to work there. He said, I was a newly graduated university student, and um, it was, they just put me there in the museum. And all the things that were there were just um, things that my, um, you will find in my grandmother's house. And I want to have a nice office in the city, not in working in a museum with, with ethnographic things that my grandmother had at her home. He was very disappointed. So, 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 <laughs> but, so this is the type of people that Stig Jonsson later then couldn't really convince because he, so he couldn't find a single archaeological object in the museums. It was just ethnographic material. Um, and then I understood that, uh, okay, during the colonial times, most of the archaeology was sporadic and uh, opportunistic, most of the material taken out of the country. Um, the government, Somali governments, didn't care much. It was a dictatorship. Um, they bulldozed stuff themselves rather than even stopping anybody from bulldozing it. So they just got on with it. And um, the, uh, then the in, after independence, the archaeologists, they also still very much uh, did similar work. 
just test bits, uh, excavated materials, reports never left with the ministries, as Stig Jonsson noted. And UNESCO came on the scene, and UNESCO sent, uh, UNESCO sent uh, um, museum experts to the museum that we inherited from the Italians, where we have all this lovely ethnographic material. And they, I interviewed uh, Professor Marek Posnanski, uh, Professor Emeritus of UCLA, and he said, Sada, my report was eaten by termites because the museum was infected by termites. It was actually not, a, um, not suitable for a museum. It was a place, um, it was a castle of the Ottoman uh, Egyptian, uh, or actually Omani, Omani Sultan, and it was right at the, at the beach. So it was not even um, a proper museum. So he said nothing ever came out of that. And also, I asked him, I said, so what did you learn about it, uh, the culture or the, 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 um, the region? And he said there was a better uh, condition in Hargeza in the north at the time, uh, but in the south and the, the capital city, there was nothing. So here we have the approach of UNESCO, which is actually not to ask people, what is your heritage? What do you want to preserve? But at the time, I should say, um, looking at just museums. And then, oh, okay, we have a museum. Somali government, very um, opportunistic, send us a, con a consultant. And they send a consultant without actually dealing with the people and their heritage uh, and asking questions and seeing what, what things matter to people. And then you have the colonial system, uh, which never really established any indigenous archaeology and uh, never intended to. And then the current, at the time, you know, archaeology again, similar manner, very much um, uh, sporadic. So, but I wanted to know then, is that enough to explain that Somali heritage was um, destroyed and looted? Is there something else in, in, this, in this situation? And that's actually when I learned that because the, the local people, they don't care about the monuments and the museums because they have their own way of preserving the past. And I call it the knowledge-centered approach. They talk about their experiences and their knowledge. Most of them are nomadic. They live and move around the landscape. And for me, this really uh, made, made, made everything to make sense because then I understood that people are actually not that interested in the, in the, in, uh, to know whether a pot is 10,000 years old or 200 years old, as long as they know that they can make it they know how to make it, what to make it from, when to make it, why, what rituals to use it for. So it was actually the whole sustainability of the tradition, the sustainability of a way of life that they felt was part of their living world rather than me, educated in the West, saying to them, you should have a museum, Bronze Age, Stone Age, Iron Age, everything in order, and you are, you know, living in the time of, you know, computers. No, but it, it just showed me that there is a tradition, there is a way of life that is different, and there is a way of transmitting knowledge, and also there is an element of needs. So they live, they do not preserve material the way we do, because they are nomads, they carry less, they have camels, the whole house can go on the camel. So for me, going back to um, then Somaliland was not easy. Although I was equipped with this understanding of, okay, now I know the local people have a knowledge about their culture. Um, I also very much faced a whole choir telling me, well, but Somalia is under emergency. Uh, it needs food shelter, peace, security. 
what are you talking about, archaeology? Um, and I had to think and reflect uh, what actually helped my family survive during the war. And it was actually not the help or the immediate help of, um, of um, aid workers and um, emergency uh, contributions coming. It was our knowledge. When we were displaced into the landscapes, it was our knowledge about medicine, about the trees, about how to build a hut that sustained us, about where to find water and food. Um, so by understanding that actually people have this sense of um, knowing how to live both in the nomadic sites but also in the, in the uh, cities helped me understand that actually cultural heritage, even archaeological knowledge, not necessarily arch certain archaeological materials, uh, is, a, is, a basic, is a basic need. It helped us get through and live and be um, to have a shelter. And I also discovered how in Somaliland, people were using cultural values to bring people together to, the, under the, to sit under the trees and talk about cultural values and disarm the militia. And they built a nascent democracy that way. So in the last 28, uh, 28 year, well, 27 years, Somaliland, which is a breakaway um, country from Somalia, has um, actually developed its own local democratic system. Uh, and there's a lot written about it. And they did that not because they were Western observers, although I'm sure Western observers are needed in many situations, is because they were able to actually go back into their own culture and sit together and face each other and say, we have, an, uh, we have had enough of war. And think about wh where is the commonness, where is the commonality? And then each leader, each lineage founder had to go to his own people and say, let's stop this nonsense. And they gathered all the weapon from the militia and told everybody to bring all your weapons to the football stadium. And actually everybody went there and put the weapon there. And then they enlisted an army. So this is the organic way that through culture, through values, people brought about peace and nascent democracy. But still, I was an archaeologist. So I had the problem to convince people that archaeology is important. Um, in a country which is not recognized, um, so I started off doing a survey. Um, uh, the Minister of Culture was already getting interested in tourism and uh, put together a number of sites. And then I met, I was so lucky to meet the president of Somaliland at the time. And I was there to do a PhD for three months uh, research. So I met the president and I said, look, you have all these amazing sites. You need to build a department of archaeology. And he said, yes, um, how long are you here for? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm leaving to London. I have my PhD to do. But, and he said, no, uh, I want you to submit within three days a proposal <laughs> for a department of archaeology. <laughs> and um, I want you to do it. And I was like, OK, <laughs> you can't say no to the president. <laughs> So um, we, I went to the minister and I said, yeah, we have to sit day and night and create a department. And this department has now celebrated 11 years and it's still um, working. I worked for, for, as the director for five years uh, and ended my tenureship at 2012. But I'm really happy because it's, it's the first stone towards building maybe Rick's Antiquaria and Betis <laughs> in the Somali context. Um, um, but then I had to go back to 
what I later saw as um, one of the things about what the people told me. They talked about the landscape. And I thought, who has talked to me about a landscape? It was my grandmother. And my grandmother used to mention this place, Obar Khadle. And especially as a PhD student, to be uh, sent out to Somaliland, it wasn't easy, but I had to convince them. Um, I was talking about heritage, and they said at UCL, but Sada, you're an archaeologist. You need a site. <laughs> so I came and I said, I have a site. And I only knew it was a shrine, but what I actually discovered was this was not just an annual shrine for a saint. Oral history said it existed for 850 years, and it was an important Islamic center. But I also learned, actually, beyond Islam, this was a multi-religious burial site. And it's just about the age, I think, um, of the, um, around the 12th century. This is what we are seeing now. We are following an ancient wall. I don't know if that's very clear to you, but we are following an ancient wall. And it's a city wall. And I've written a book about this, which is coming out uh, hopefully early next year, called Divine Fertility. But for me, this research has taken a long time to compile. And it, one of the reasons is because the site has the whole pilgrimage uh, element to it. The, sacred, the saint is uh, uh, very much revered. He's the first to bring writing into Somali culture. Um, but he is also um, an international saint who has spread uh, Islam across the region. But also in this site, there are a lot of practices. So um, there are communities who, everybody, everyone is Muslim, but there are traditional practices. Um, so what you, um, what you discover there is the fact that actually Things are happening in different layers. Not just is the archaeology uh, showing um, Christian material, Islamic material, and hence changing how we think about our past, but the continuity of the place. People are actually practicing certain rituals that now I saw only from Ethiopia or Kenya. And this helped me to then understand, again, why Somalis were uninterested of the archaeology beyond Islam. Because there is the myth of origin which says all Somalis come from the lineage founders, and the lineage founders come from Arabia. So anything non-Islamic in the country in that, following that myth would be non-Somali. Hence, it's okay to loot. Hence, it's okay to destroy if you find grave goods and things like that. So it actually helped me understand how people relate to archaeology from the perspective of identity. And now I was not only trying to convince people about the importance of archaeology, but also to all of a sudden explain the weird things I was finding in, in the site. And one of them is the phallic stones. And I thought, how interesting. How are these used? And what is their use? And I learned that actually um, one of the important rituals that take place at this site is a fertility ritual. And people, uh, much like the way we have the Mitsomasto, um, have, similar have had similar fertility rituals. I can't say for sure that people went around and did smoke rude and smoke. <laughs> I don't think they did that, but I, I, it's a very special thing. And I think what people have actually missed here is that um, the way that even in, in, in the Scandinavian culture, the Swedish culture, we have kept certain rituals because they are fun. Yeah? We, we should never forget that. Um, and other people have also kept curious, fun things. And um, in this landscape, which is very Muslim, people have um, 
ignored to a certain degree other things uh, that they couldn't make sense of, but looked a bit curious, hence the phallic stone. But the interesting about the phallic stone also is that it goes through uh, a layer of the whole, whole, whole of the whole, whole of Africa, and it's associated with um, um, different traditions that we have. Um, but this site that I just explained is often associated with also the other, other groups that are stigmatized who are seen to be the weird things. So they are always responsible for all the weird things we find. People say, oh yeah, you found the phallic stones. You know those people, they, they, they are here. They use the, the, yeah, this must be from them, right? But it's actually a heritage that everybody at some point adhered to. All over the Horn of Africa, you have phallic stones, it's normal. Some of those communities who are just as Somali as me, who have the same culture, are seen as low caste. And many of them are trying, they, they live in crowded places, and they are trying to um, um, survive by trying to making things from their skills, um, and the artisans, some of them are the smiths, the hunters who make uh, leather objects, and also pot potters. Uh, and they live in a very crowded area. Um, and for me, as an archaeologist, I come across material culture mainly. So when I dig things up, who does it belong to? Does it belong to the noble? Or does it belong to the low caste? If the noble are supposed to say, oh, look at our grand past, or beautiful things, then they have to acknowledge the material which would have been made by specialist groups. And how are we treating today our specialist groups? As subhumans, uh, because they, people don't intermarry with them. And they told me about, about their lives, about their, um, um, their situation. And in, this man is explaining, for example, um, how they made this, uh, how much money they earn from it. And all of these th little um, things that they get, little um, NGOs come and give them a little project. Um, is actually very reductive to their culture because it, it really limits their lives. And a lot of them um, are very um, rightly um, and, you know, angry. And some of the women who I spoke to here talk about their, their situation because it's not just a society that's looking down at members of its society, but it's also a critical group of people who have a lot to contribute and offer. Um, I'm not sure if I can uh, move forward a bit with this, but one of the things that uh, is critical is that this community is actually, um, because they are at the bottom of society, now we have in Ethiopia, uh, a lot of Oromo refugees come from Ethiopia to Somaliland. But also recently, a lot of Yemenis come from Yemen. And often, as you'll find in many societies, refugees, when they come, they end up at the bottom of society. And the people that they interact and communicate with are actually um, people who are also s struggling themselves. And it made me reflect a little bit about um, when I was a refugee and I came here and uh, I was looked after by, you know, by the state, but also by the people that I met on a day to day. And looking at this, the community, which is already a minority, or, you know, they, um, who are themselves struggling, 
are actually helping refugees. So one of those refugees is a woman, and she is actually ethnically from the noble clans, but she comes from Yemen. So her whole life, generations, they've lived in Yemen, and now they come back as a refugee. And she's annoyed because she's saying, how can Somalis differentiate themselves this way? So she speaks in a broken Somali because Somali is not um, her first language, Arabic is. But the interesting thing is that she talks about, she faces the camera and she talks to me and says, um, we are all equal. When I came here, these people looked after me and I am Achi. She says, so she's from the noble clans, but she comes from Yemen. And they looked after me. And then she starts to tell about her Islamic knowledge. So she uses Islam, which actually others are using to make these people to, to say that they are not righteous. She uses to say we are all equal. And she quotes, and this is the woman, so she quotes, uh, um, uh, the Quran speaking in a beautiful Arabic which the noble clans would admire her knowledge of Arabic and that she um, can, can read the Quran. But I felt this was so powerful because it just shows how by her moving, by her coming and finding herself in that situation, she's, she didn't tell me, oh, I'm a poor refugee from Yemen, can you help me? She was very angry that she found people who were seen as inferior, uh, and she found that very uh, uh, maddening. So this is the lady, and she's talking about this. Um, so for me, archaeology has a, a message to, to, to deliver in showing communities who are able to form unity and to inform that the actual objects are can be tools to communicate that commonness. This is um, um, the first time I came back to Somaliland, at the time when I came back uh, in 2007. My family performed dances, um, uh, dances for me. Um, can I go back? Uh, so this dance, um, it's interesting because just uh, a year before, I worked with the UN to, to record Somali um, um, traditions, such as uh, the traditional dances and intangible heritage. And we couldn't locate a single place in the Somali region where these dances were taking place. But then when I came to see my family, these are the dances they performed. So there are pockets of areas where people are persistent with their traditions and cultures. And again, we are moving in time, in ideology, in beliefs, and there are fundamental changes taking place where all of a sudden Somali traditional dresses disappear, Somali dances disappear, Somali poetry disappears, and some people are trying to fight that and bring and keep that tradition. And I was lucky to experience this um, because it doesn't continue. And for me, this is critical all in the sense of bringing it all together through um, what I have uh, done through material culture, because I think material culture has a... Has a has a role, has a, it's a powerful tool in helping us continue, continue tradition, uh, you, know, uh, in the, in the, you know, in the wave of changes. Because um, these cultural materials that continue are there for a reason, and they're almost like a glue, uh, a generational glue. And one of those generational glues is this Wagar, which I inherited from my grandmother. And in fact, which is one of the reasons I, 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 I went back. Um, and my grandmother um, came later to Sweden to join the family. 
um, because we couldn't live about we couldn't live without our mother, and our mother couldn't live without her mother. Um, so she came, and now since uh, over ten years, she's buried in Sweden. So all of a sudden, we have the first member of the, our family, and the one who was least likely to be buried outside her country, um, being here, uh, and I'm very interested to hear in 10,000 years what the archaeologists make of her skeleton. <laughs> and, um, but what it led me to was I was very curious about it. I said, what is it? And she would use it. She said, oh, it's against shaitan. And shaitan is the devil and evil spirits. But by me having this with me and interrogating, I actually learned that this was part of an indigenous regional religion in the Horn of Africa. And uh, the Wagar is one of the, one of the symbols of the god. And I say unknown gods because I think certain things should still be unknown. Um, I can come with my theories, other people can come up with their theories, but certain things are there and we don't really know what they are, but they should be able to continue. What is important is how we use them and what information we can get from this history. And for me, the way that my grandmother used the worker and what people told me about it was that it was a sacred object. And for the first time, I had something that everybody in the Somali community agreed upon. <laughs> because this is a conflict region, people do not agree on a lot. So everybody I asked, I said, oh, the worker, do you know what it is? And she said, oh, yeah, the worker, it's a sacred object. And I said, oh, good. Um, um, so I thought, okay, one sure fact down, but why do we have sacred trees? Why do we have sacred objects? And it turns out to be that actually the, the worker is made of the olive, the African olive, and the olive forests are sacred. And then I thought, why are the olive forests sacred? And why are the other forests sacred? And then I learned, actually, in the same way that people have a way of preserving material culture through oral heritage, there is a way of preserving the natural heritage. So by saying it's sacred forest, it meant that people couldn't cut it down. And sometimes they would say, that side of the mountain, those, the, that habitat, we don't go in this time of year because this and this spirit lives there. But it's actually also a mechanism to re regenerate the landscape and look after the landscape. So often people see nomads and say, oh, they're overusing the landscape. It's not them overusing it, it's actually other people forcing the nomads move in a certain way that is for them the only way they can find is uh, maybe uh, over uh, overusing a certain landscape and also these places are actually m often medicinal because why is this forest sacred it's often because it has a medicinal element to it and one of the things i studied was the um, uh, butterfly bush and now i'm looking at actually um, then um, how then to print, to come from the, the issue of medicine, looking at the landscape, the natural, but also the cultural, but also the script. And script in an oral culture can be the way we say things, a ritual script. Um, and also the actual rituals and how we move, but also time and how that time element impacts memory and what we deem important and what lessons we are after uh, in terms of heritage, because we should have purpose with what we do. What is our purpose? And I just want to uh, leave you with that uh, notion that we have to find uh, what is the particular purpose of the things that we are trying to get out of heritage. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. 
Okay, we're going to continue with the conversation between Sada Mire and Karin Altenberg. So I would like to welcome Karin up on stage. Karin eh, is working at Riksant Aquarium Betest as a senior advisor. And you have a PhD degree in historical archaeology. That's right, yes. And we also know you as an author. Some yeah. may do, yes. I do, <laughs> I do for sure. <laughs> I also recommend your books. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to leave the stage to the two of you. Please enjoy. Thank you very Thank much. You. And would you like to sit oh, down? Sit. Sure. Sure. Let's sit down. Thank you, Sada, so very much for so generously inviting us to take a step on your journey, that is your professional journey, your intellectual journey, but also your very personal journey. And you left us with this question of the purpose. What is the purpose? And I think, you know, you didn't really need to leave us with that question because you did give us purpose today, I think. And um, I wanted to return briefly to um, your, your work as an archaeologist and what the purpose of that was and what you actually did. Because you said in a TED talk that I listened to that you quoted Basil Davidson, who was um, the late British writer and um, uh, anti-colonialist and anti-apartheid activist, who said that if you want to write the history of Africa, you have to excavated first, which is sort of what you did, isn't it? You, you, you went in and you looked uh, for the gaps in the historical record. There is a record which is very much the kind of uh, reinforced story of, um, of slavery and colonialism and post-colonialism, um, but you were looking, I think, for something else, the kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the curious and the fun, but also the human agency um, and what do you think that, I mean, what, so that's a kind of revisionist history. You, you're trying to not particularly rewrite history, but fill in the gaps to create a history that we can build new stories from. And uh, I, I would, I think your purpose, if I may suggest, is to create a, rev a revisionist future to, to sort of form alternative paths for the people of Somaliland to, to find an, a different kind of future. What would you say to that? Yeah, very much so. I think um, for me it was about, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, realizing um, that the image I had from uh, of Sweden coming as a refugee and feeling, wow, you know, so developed. The people were like superhumans. <laughs> I, 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 I felt so inferior. I just come from a failed country. But um, but then just going back 100 years in history, I thought, wow, this I can relate to so much. So I felt in Somalia, there must be a time when things were good. And I need to understand that history and how that can be powerful to, to know that you can overcome uh, a, a difficulty the way that Sweden overcame and also see that perhaps uh, there was a time when things were different. And often, it's actually that narrative of, of allowing yourself to imagine that you were something different than what you are today, that I think even on individual level helps us to get through things, because tomorrow you might be wealthy, the next day you might be poor, today you might be healthy, but the next day you might be ill. So if you if you can understand and learn life skills that, and perspectives that can get you through those difficult times and you know your history, uh, it's not just about you know, revising the history. And sh In fact, in Africa, obviously, we had that situation where so little is written about. We have to rewrite the history books and put in beyond colonialism, beyond slavery. But on the personal level, it's also getting force and power from that and, you know, on a, as a nation or as an individual, by knowing your own history or the history of your people, or even history of other people, 
the way I did when I came to Sweden to, to pull out the things that can resonate with you and, and, and help you uh, move forward. Uh, How do you negotiate your multiple identities coming from, you know, so you are Swedish, Somali, um, you studied in England, so you got a, you, the European archaeologist, the woman of the diaspora, or the woman and the person of the diaspora, coming back to a place uh, from which you were kind of deracinated. How, how do you negotiate that with the local population that you meet? How do they perceive you in that situation? Yeah, that's actually multiple. I went through multiple um, cultural shocks. And the first one actually was obviously uh, growing up in Somalia and then coming to Sweden. But then I think, and then I learned what I learned and I took so much for granted that I, when I ended up in England even, I faced cultural shock because in, in England there, even as a woman, as a Swedish woman, there is difference. Uh, I remember um, even the archaeological tradition, um, there were differences, there were things I was noticing that I would not have noticed if I had come from Somalia and come to England. I had to have come from Sweden to actually notice and say, well, okay, that's interesting, well, that's a bit odd. And I think also people do not expect me to, to, to see that. So often people would say, oh, you know, um, in England or somewhere else, say, oh, you're Somali. And, and I say, well, um, and they can say, but you're not really Somali. And I say, yeah, not completely. <laughs> there is something else too. And that comes through, I think, as I move around. But the local community, it's often, I think, um, at the time when I went back, there weren't many young Somali women going back. And especially, um, very few, I think, would, would be setting up government institutions dealing with people who were much older than them to, 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 to get them to do things, wearing trousers and boots, as I was afternoon going to the sites. So I think the way that people locally made sense of, and in fact, there was. UCL did a, a story of me going back, but it was just for the UCL website, and it said um, Somaliland archaeologist, or, or uh, UCL archaeologist, a bit possessive, UCL archaeologist goes back to Somaliland. And then I thought that was obviously for the university, and I thought, great, now they will give me a permission to go. But then I went, and I think I, it was published on a Friday, and I, on a Sunday, as I went out to the field in Somaliland, and I'm there for the first time, a front cover of the local Somaliland Horn Tribune had that story at the front cover from UCL's little webpage. So a month later, when I came back from the field, and I was, wanted to show the president my sights, they already had this picture of me with dreadlocks and tight t-shirt circulating. <laughs> circulating. So, so somehow I think that kind of gave me away my second identity. <laughs> yes, that, that's a very particular identity. Another one which I read about on your website is that you've been referred to as the Johnny Cash of archaeology. <laughs> What does that mean? I mean, I could think of a lot of perhaps more better, more appropriate, and actually cooler comparisons. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it was because I, um, well, it's so undeserved title. I like Johnny Cash, but yeah. But the, I, I think it was a comment by one of, one of the conference organizers in the UK when I was coming, um, because I had just finished a field trip where I gave a talk at uh, a women's prison uh, in Sweden. And this women's prison... Um, uh, in Sweden? Sorry, in Somaliland. Hey, see, I'm traveling beyond <laughs> in Somaliland. And they... Um, it was a really interesting experience because I actually I received a letter from a US prisoner 
sent to my Leiden University. And as I opened every day my mail, I saw this letter and I saw it's a precinct, Massachusetts. I thought, what a weird. And I was going to have a meeting, so I opened it in the meeting, and then I passed on to one of my colleagues, one of the professors, and he read it, and we both looked at each other. And it was an American prisoner in Massachusetts who wanted uh, me to send him curriculum. And then I went home with the letter, um, came back next day, spoke to one of my friends, uh, and, and I thought, okay, so, I realized this was because I did a, 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 a program, a PBS program, and thought maybe that's how he found me. But what it actually did was it brought me back to the time when I used to do a lot of Vereningsliv, <laughs> voluntary work, and I used to work for Amnesty Malmö, M Amnesty International. And I started thinking about it, and my own father was in prison, uh, tortured, and eventually died as a result of torture. So it really brought me back into that, and I th felt, okay, I can't teach him in prison. I don't care what he's done. And I'm always advocate of the Swedish system, you know, the fact that we don't just have punishment, we have uh, rehabilitation, rather in terms for prisoners, and, and for me, equality and equal education, access to education is very important, like the MOOC. So we were, I was able to say, okay, he can do the MOOC, which is the open access course from Leiden University, and anybody can do that uh, anywhere in the world. So I, I don't have to personally teach him, but he can do that MOOC and other online courses. And so that sort of goes back to the human, that you refer to archaeology or heritage as a human need. And for him, for example, what, what were you hoping that he would get out of, of this education that you were offering inside the prison? I actually, I didn't know what I was hoping he would get out of, but I think I was just finding him an answer, because I thought this is somebody who is seeking uh, knowledge. And uh, we did a bit of research and we saw actually this person does exist and he has enrolled for courses and he even, I think, published something online through Amazon. So it's somebody who actually was trying to um, get access. But by giving my, then that led me to feel, okay, I really want to go and see what a prison looks like. And the only place where I knew I could get quick access and to speak to prisoners and give an archaeology lecture was in Somaliland. And also in Somali society, often women are neglected, and especially if they end up in prison. Men, women will visit their husbands in prison, sisters will visit the brothers, they will bring every week food, they take their clothes, they will wash it for them. But women prisoners is another story. So, by actually going and listening to the women in the prison, they told me, you know, we are healthy, we eat, but we need basic things. So after discussing all of these quite basic things, uh, then I started telling them a little bit about archaeology. And I think what I, um, then they got out of it was, wow, so, you know, they, they could really recognize some of the things I was talking about, the archaeological sites, when I mentioned Obar Khadle, th they had been there. So these are normal people who up to a point were living just like anyone else, and then their lives got interrupted for the bad choices they've made. So I think education in prison can help people then later make better, change, better choices. I was thinking about the, what you were saying about your um, the kind of local knowledge of place and landscape, uh, which ecologists now are right are sort of talking a lot about how we can uh, sort of reconstruct a deeper knowledge of territory, which is basically what archaeologists have always been doing. So I think the connection between ecology and archaeology could be re-strengthened. Um, so the, the two things, isn't it, the kind of that we are of a place, and and it's important to that's where we start, uh, and we can we move as migrants. We may uh, have to move to another place, but then we have to be of that place again, and it's where we learn a language. We name the place. We we uh, communicate with 
people there. And the other aspect is the time aspect of archaeology, which is trying to understand what it is to be human in another place in another time. Mm. And that, uh, like Lars was saying earlier today, is a way of kind of understanding um, the other and getting a, a, perhaps a more compassion and uh, interest and curiosity in other ways of living uh, a life. This is not a question anymore, actually. Yeah, it started off I as a question. I think but this is so interesting because um, it actually makes me think about your work, the, the book about um, Island of Wings, where actually I got attracted to it because it was going historically and it was interesting reading an archaeologist, the landscape archaeologist from Sweden, getting into that Scottish landscape. So for me, if you could compare, it's a bit like that in a way for me to, to really look at the anthropology and the, the, the how people are currently living with those landscapes and then bridging their knowledge gap, but also bringing out new things which are not just um, reproducing their myths, but rather um, unsettling sometimes their whole um, narrative. I think, I mean, all, all art, all writing is a kind of investigation. It's, it's um, an exploration of another world. And in that way, it's very much like archaeology. But the, the big difference, of course, is that as an archaeologist, you are a scientist. You have a, a kind of method methodology. You ask questions, and you, you're supposed to answer the question. You're supposed to say, um, Ida was talking about this earlier today as well, um, there's always you say, uh, believe this. Whereas if you write a fiction, you just say, consider this. You just mm. ask the questions. And I, I sort of like to, to move between the two. But um, as we're talking about literature, we can go back to your, the very start of your talk and um, Pandas Forgeström and all the Swedish writers that influenced you. And of course, you're also multilingual. How many languages do you speak? Um, <laughs> well, um Confidently, uh, really not many, Somali, English, Swedish. But when I am not here and not many Danish and Norwegians can hear me, I say, I speak Norwegian, Danish, which makes sound as if I know many languages. And what about Dutch? Um, I know a bit of disappointingly uh, little Dutch, but I read for my, uh, for, my, for my child, for example, Dutch books. And I studied Kiswahili, I, so I know some Kiswahili, I know some French, I know some Arabic, and I've learned to say some, because I'll, yeah, I <laughs> all of a sudden there is somebody speaking to me in full. <laughs> so you, you wanted us to speak English today. I also know that, so maybe that is because you, it's a professional language for you at the moment. I also know, because you told me last night, that you are writing another book, if you don't mind me mentioning it, um, a more personal book. What language will you write that book in? Uh, I think this is a very interesting question, because just like I was trying to write this speech, and I kept writing part of it in Swedish, because that's how I got into that environment. And I also wrote part of it in English, and I'm doing the same. So I have to kind of go back and rewrite it into complete English, because it's, uh, if the thought takes me... I mean, I had this very weird experience. The first month I came to England, London, I was trying to find the uh, Egypt Exploration Society because I was doing an Egyptian archaeology course. I went to the address, Doughty Street, it's based on, and as I was walking, I thought I was in Lund in my head, at Lund University, because it's kind of muse, you know, with a, you know, pebble stone. And as I reach the address, and my brain is working because I am going to the house, I knock, somebody opens the place, and I speak Swedish for about a minute and a half. And the man looks at me, and some, at some moment, I'm thinking, wow, I'm speaking Swedish, and I'm in England. And this is so embarrassing, <laughs> because here I am, this British uh, man looking at this black woman in London. Okay, that's quite common, right? But randomly speaking Swedish. <laughs> and I just thought, 
that I, that was probably the most embarrassing moment of <laughs> language wise i think you're a true cosmopolitan <laughs> fine. um i think it's time for some questions is that, sorry yeah so nadia do we have any questions Ja, vi har frågor. Ni fick ju ställa frågor på svenska, men sa att vi har fått den på engelska. Så språklig, eh, ja, jag vet inte. Vi, vi är världsmedborgare. Vi tar en fråga på engelska. Det som har kommit in är, sa att tell us about your greatest challenges in your work. Well, that's a question. <laughs> I've been telling my greatest challenges so far. Um... um Well, um, I think the challenges are really, um, again, adapting to differences, adapting to, um, I think, um, of course, as a woman, uh, navigating through gender, also navigating through class, navigating through nationalism, navigating in any context, I have a lot of uh, conflicts in the sense that people have their perceived ideas and doing the field work, working in a context that's completely different to my other context, all of those create uh, very um, concrete challenges. But I think the most important challenge, I think, is one for all of us. And it's, uh, I think, also something that, for me, archaeology uh, presents in uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa, and especially in Somaliland, that, and in Somalia heritage and archaeology, that people need to... The fact that it forces people to understand that there is a different narrative, there is a different identity. And that, um, getting used to that, and actually being comfortable with that, and accepting that, and how that can empower us today as people who are moving around um, from different cultures, uh, from different continents, uh, adopting to those changes and differences. For me, uh, uh, a big I see as a as a big challenge, but but also a huge opportunity for humanity. Tack Sada. Um, vi ska ta en kort bensträckare på tio minuter men innan vi reser oss upp och tar denna bensträckare en varm applåd till Karin och Sara. Thank you very very much.